In the blessed Lord's command, and the walls came tumbling down. And the walls, and the walls, mighty walls, the walls came tumbling down. Joshua, 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 marched seven times around. Well, the walls, and the walls, mighty walls, yes, the walls came tumbling down, and the walls came tumbling down. Well, if you have trusted in the power of the blood and you hope to wear a crown, just follow faithfully the blessed Lord's command. Walls of doubt will tumble down. And the walls, and the walls, mighty walls, yes, the walls came tumbling down. Joshua, 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 March seven times a came tumbling down and the walls came tumbling down 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 down, down, down. one of these days when I retire from this life There'll be no heartache, there'll be no strife It's just across the river to a land so fair It's a place that they call Hallelujah Square When I move, move to Hallelujah Square All of my love is gonna wait for me there And then I'll never have a burden to bear When I move to Hallelujah Square Yes, when I move to Hallelujah Square There'll be no sorrow, there'll be no pain The weather never changes, it's always the same And I'll never have a burden, I'll never have a care When I get to a place called Hallelujah Square When I move, move to Hallelujah Square All of my love is gonna wait for me there And then I'll never have a burden to bear When I move to Hallelujah Square Yes, when I move to Hallelujah Square Move to Hallelujah Square all of my love is gonna wait for me there And then I'll never have a burden to bear When I move to Hallelujah Square Yes, when I move to Hallelujah Square Yes, when I move to Hallelujah Square Thank you. 
Making the sun to shine, putting the stars in the sky for the flowers that bloom, the ocean so blue. Thank you, Lord, for the sparrow that sings. It makes sweet melody for the rivers that flow, the rain and I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for me. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to I could not stand. Thank you, Lord, for giving your life for me on the cross of Calvary, for taking my place. Mercy and grace. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord, for making me whole, saving my soul.
can do it to him, there's nothing to it. I know the seem to do it, sweet victory. Well, even when storms are raging, he is the rock of ages. I know that he is able, mighty is he. They marched around the walls of Jericho. They knew that they would fall, God told them so. Just like he worked for them, he's working now. My God will never change, he has great power. To him, there's nothing to it. I know he'll see me through with sweet victory. Well, even when storms are raging, he is the rock of ages. I know that he is able, mighty is he. I know that he is able, mighty. This morning feeling fine I woke up with heaven on my mind I woke up with joy in my soul For I knew my Lord had control Well, I knew I was walking in the light Cause I've been on my knees in the night And I prayed till the Lord gave a sign And now I'm feeling mighty fine Well, I'm feeling mighty fine Feeling fine fine. Heaven on my mind mind. On my mind Don't you know I I want to go go. Yes, I want to go Milk and honey flow Milk and honey flow There's a light that always shines Always shines shines. In this heart of mine Jesus all the time We're walking and talking as we climb We're traveling a road to the sky Where I know I'll live when I die He's been telling me all about that land And he tells me that everything is grand And he says that a home will be mine
right, good evening. Welcome to White Oak Baptist Church Wednesday evening service. Please find your places and get ready. Uh, pick up a hymnal, if you would, and turn to hymn 334. Hymn 334, we'll sing the light of the world and we'll sing the first, the third, and fourth. The light of the world is Jesus. First, third, and fourth, please. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine at noonday, his glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see The light of the world is Jesus Number three Ye dwellers in darkness with sin-blinded eyes The light of the world is Jesus Go wash at his bidding and light will arise The light of the world is Jesus us. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Number four. No need of the sunlight in heaven, we're told. The light of the world is Jesus. The Lamb is the light in the city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Aren't you thankful for the light of the world? And he shines light in all the dark corners, in all the dark corners we let him shine. And one day we're going to get to heaven, and there will be no sun, because Jesus will be the light that will light up the whole place. There won't be any shadows in heaven. No place for bad people to hide and no bad people to hide in any places. And all of us bad people will be given new bodies and we won't have any more struggles. And we won't have any more pain. We won't have any of that. It'll just be a wonderful place. And guess what? It'll be forever. It'll be forever. And all the cares that you're carrying on you right now will cease to exist. God's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. And we're going to walk up and down streets of gold, shouting glory, hallelujah, looking in, the sa looking in the face of our Savior. And then we'll look back over our shoulder and we'll think that was just like a hiccup on earth. And uh, I can't wait for that day to come. I, Jesus comes back right now. We get to start a seven-year feast. And uh, I had a good dinner tonight at home, but I'm up, I'm up to eat a little more. Amen? Amen. And, uh, we're just looking forward to that day. But until then, let's work till Jesus comes. And let me just say thank you to all of you who've labored hard all day and you have put in a good day's work and you have showed up to church tonight. And uh, it, it means a lot to me as your pastor. It means a lot to the Lord. And I hope that uh, when you walk out the door tonight, you'll feel lifted up by your brothers and sisters in Christ. You'll feel lifted up through the preaching of God's word and the teaching of God's word. And so uh, look around tonight. There's only a few of us here right now. More people are trickling in, but... Find someone you haven't spoken to yet, pump their hand, let them know you're glad they're here, put a smile on their face. We'll sing that chorus in just a minute. Amen. All right. Sorry, Lizette, you got to be ready for that.
As you find your way back to your seats, let's sing that chorus. The light of the world is Jesus. Ready? Come, come to the light, tis shining for thee. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. And let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and ask him to give us a good night in his house as we pray. We'd ask uh, uh, Mike and Kowski, if you would, from where you're at, just raise your voice and open us in prayer. Amen. You can be seated. And how many of you have uh, prayer request slips filled out, ready to go? You can hold those up. If you hold up an empty hand, then uh, that will signify that you need a prayer slip. And so we'll get you one of those. While we're waiting on that, who has something they're thankful for, a testimony they want to share? Keep it brief. Anybody? Amen. Amen. Thanks for sharing that, Bob. God's faithful to provide, isn't he? We just have to trust him, and he always does provide. Listen, God provides for us as Christians, whether we trust him or not. It's just a, our, our lives are filled with a lot less worry if we just trust him. So he's, he's very good to us that way. Anybody else? Quickly, Barb? Amen. Prayer matters. It really does. Thank you, Barb. All right. Uh, Jamie, go ahead. Amen. We prayed for you Sunday night with you being sick. I didn't go into details, but I, I told everyone you, were, you weren't feeling good, and we prayed for you before church Sunday night. We're glad to see you're doing better. Glad to see you on your feet. All right, uh, Brother John, if you'll come at this time, lots of prayer requests. I'm going to hold on to this one that's folded, but uh, if you go over those and then, uh, lead, and then have the prayer time. Good evening. I have... Uh, Quite a few requests. I'll go through them uh, real quickly. Um, this is from uh, Brian. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, it says, please pray for Nate, four-year-old grandson of my ex-husband's uh, for a brain tumor. Who? Okay. Okay. Let's see, I have here um, for Marcy, uh, prayer, uh, salvation, and healing for Michael Kasulius. Kasulius, yep. Uh, he's in the hospital, bleeding, uh, and he has, several, has, has had several surgeries, I guess. And then uh, I have here one. Um, uh, this is from. Uh, This is from, uh, I can't read the first name, but, but that uh, it says, 
It says, friend, I, I can't really read it too well. I'll just have to set that one aside. Well, um, also, here's one for Ed, um, just a thank you. Is it, I, they're not making any sense to me. I don't know what to, to do with them. Okay. I uh, have one here from Mar Marie Yankowski, a praise. Uh, her endoscopy went well. Uh, biopsy was uh, benign. Still have um, hiatal hernia and acid reflux, but a lot better result uh, than it could ever be. Okay, that it could have been. Okay. And then we have one from uh, Kyle uh, for Hayden. Is that the right name? Uh, your sister. Okay. Uh, for guidance in her life and to make the right decisions as uh, she transfers into high school. And then I uh, have one here from Rose Pacenti for, for her travel to Pennsylvania on Friday. And then there's an uh, unspoken one here, uh, Ron, protection for him and others, that God would intervene in, the, in, in this present crisis and begin, bring him to uh, his knees in repentance. Okay. All right, why don't we, uh, why don't we pray? And I'll, I'll uh, try to find out who had these, and uh, I'll pray for them. Okay. If uh, the gentleman, if any of the gentlemen would like to come forward, you're welcome to. And uh, after I'm done praying, I'm going to have Kyle come up, and then uh, Mike Surratt will come up. Why don't we pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this time of prayer. And uh, Lord, um, you know, as we um, learned on um, Sunday night, uh, Lord, we, we do want to uh, just give you praise, and we want to honor you, and uh, thank you for the loving God that you are and the patient God that you are. And uh, Lord, we just, uh, there's so much we could say in the way of your attributes, uh, Lord, and uh, the mercy and grace and the love you bestow on each one of us and actually on the whole world. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for these um, attributes. We're thankful for your, your, your kindness. And uh, Lord, we're thankful that you're a God of reconciliation. Uh, Lord, so uh, we thank you in, in many ways. But now, Lord, we do come uh, as we approach your throne of grace, uh, Lord, we bring these prayer requests before you. Uh, we do pray for Ron, for protection for him and others, um, that God would uh, intervene in this uh, present crisis and begin and bring him to his knees in repentance. Um, uh, Lord, we do ask, uh, Lord, for your intervention, uh, Lord, that you would uh, intercede in, uh, in, in, on behalf of Ron and uh, maybe even on others, uh, Lord, and they would uh, begin... Uh, um, asking for forgiveness and uh, repentance in their lives. And Lord, we also pray for uh, Rose Pacenti as she's be traveling to uh, uh, Pennsylvania on Friday uh, to see her grandbaby. Uh, Lord, I do pray that you give her traveling mercies and safety. Pray that you give her a good time as she, uh, uh, as she visits the family, the, the, this little baby, as well as her daughter and others. Uh, but Lord, we do ask that you'd guide and direct and, uh, and that your will would be done in this matter. And so, Lord, we, we don't know the details, and, uh, and uh, we don't know all the, and Lord, I'm sure that you do know the details for sure, but Lord, maybe uh, it'll just be a step at a time as, uh, as Rose will find out uh, as you uh, reveal your will for her in, in, in this matter. And then also, Lord, we do pray for Kyle, uh, her, his sister, Hayden, uh, for guidance in her uh, life uh, to make the right decisions as she's going to begin to transfer or transition rather into high school. Uh, Lord, we do pray uh, as a young uh, teenager that, uh, that you'd give her protection, that you'd uh, guide her for sure and direct her. Uh, Lord, that you would uh, actually put a hedge of protection around her uh, as she uh, goes into a, um, a new school and, um, and, and where things tend to get a little bit more um, I don't know, um, just a little bit more difficult in one's life as, as uh, more peer pressure and what have you is not uh, forced on, on, on the younger teenagers. So, Lord, we do pray that you'd guide her and protect her and give her that protection. And then, Lord, we also pray for uh, Marie Yankowski. Actually, it's a praise, but we do pray for her that you would continue to touch her and heal her and, and heal her in, uh, with the acid reflux that she has and the hiatal hernia that she's dealing with. Lord, I pray that you'd... Uh, uh, give the doctors wisdom as they uh, treat uh, these um, conditions, uh, that you would uh, uh, give her strength, and, uh, and as the doctors treat, whether they be through um, uh, surgery, I don't think so necessarily, but maybe through medication, I pray, Lord, that everything would just uh, work out well and that she would have, uh, have good health. And uh, we do praise you, God, that uh, the biopsy was benign. 
And then, Lord, we also pray for um, uh, this from Marcy for uh, prayer and healing and salvation for Michael Cusilius. Um, he's in the hospital. He's had several surgeries. He's bleeding. He uh, has a difficult uh, situation in his life right now. Lord, I pray that you would comfort him. That, uh, and, and, and Lord, I just pray that you would draw him close and that he would trust Christ as his Savior. Lord, and, and Lord, I would trust that if he, if, if, he even knew, if he knows Jesus in a personal way, that uh, he would seek, he would actually see your uh, comfort and your, and your uh, protection upon him. But Lord, we do uh, intercede. We do actually uh, ask for uh, that, that healing power upon him and that protection upon him and the comfort upon him that you would provide, Lord. And then, Lord, we also pray for, um, uh, Jamie's asking for a prayer for, uh, this is through uh, her husband's, um, ex-husband's uh, uh, relation. I'll say it that way. It's just this little four-year-old that has a brain tumor. Uh, Lord, we do pray for this little one. Uh, Lord, I pray that you, would, uh, that you would heal him. Lord, I do pray that you would uh, touch him. I pray that you would, uh, whatever needs to be done, Lord, if the, if the doctors need to do uh, surgery or, or, or some kind of uh, uh, therapy of some sort, Lord, I pray that it would have a, a, a great effect in, in healing him. But, Lord, we do ask that your healing hand would be upon him and that your, uh, your, your wisdom would be upon doctors and others that would, uh, that, uh, would intercede and, and help this little one. And we do pray for the uh, family, uh, that you'd comfort them during this uh, difficult time and that you'd uh, just be with this family at this time. And then, Lord, I do pray, um, aside from these requests, I do pray as we uh, are coming upon a Memorial Day weekend, um, Lord, thank you uh, for this country that we're able to live in. Uh, thank you for, the, uh, for the, uh, um, your hand of protection upon it and your, your many blessings upon it on this country. And, uh, Lord, uh, we know that uh, Memorial Day is an is a, a, a day that we set aside as a country to uh, to recognize and honor those who have um, have given the ultimate in the way of their life uh, for for in, during battle or during war. Uh, so, Lord, we do ask that you would uh, comfort families as they look back and see the loved ones that have um, perished. Uh, but, Lord, we thank you for your hand of protection upon this this country. And Lord, we do ask that you bless uh, the families and bless this nation. Lord, help us um, not to just look at it as a, uh, a more like a party, but help us to uh, just have a hearts that would mourn uh, for a loss. But Lord, uh, help us also to see that truly you gave the ultimate sacrifice of your own son. And so, Lord, we do thank you um, as we can acknowledge the Memorial Day holiday, but we, Lord, help us to acknowledge you and, and your great love and the, the great sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, now, Lord, we do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I, uh, I just want to thank you for all of your uh, many blessings you've just given me and everyone I'm sure in this room we all have something to thank you for today and thank you for your protection and just guidance over everything we do and just I, I want to praise you for that and I want to thank you for all you're doing in all of our lives and just um, keep protecting and guiding everyone here and especially those that we just prayed for also Lord could you uh, please help uh, Pastor Michael Patella um, for uh, or, or Michael Patella um, for salvation and that you just, I don't know what he's going to face this week, but you do. And, and anything small or large, just I pray he gets closer to Jesus and closer to salvation through his, just his daily work, whatever he does. To, uh, please um, just help him to see that he is a sinner and needs a Savior. Help him come to that realization. Um, also, the same uh, prayer, really, for uh, Victor Ladino, that he uh, comes to your saving grace. Um, I know you want these... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, souls uh, save more than I ever could or anyone else ever could um, they're, they're I mean you've created them uh, created everyone so uh, please help them everyone that's on the salvation prayer list uh, just come to your saving grace um, help Thomas Moisick uh, to come to your saving grace as well uh, just uh, there's so many names here for salvation probably more in this church I uh, but uh, these three um, help 
this week and just guide and uh, direct them uh, to you. Um, help uh, our Vice President Mike Pence to make decisions that go with you and not against you. I, um, I heard you know, a long line somewhere that he may have been saved, but uh, if he's not, only you know. I pray he just uh, gets closer to you and that he uh, you know, walks with you to help uh, guide our country and help uh, Mayor Blake in Milford to make the decisions that are pleasing to you and that uh, don't take away anything from you or from uh, uh, your kingdom that you're trying to do here on earth. Um, help him to just make the right decisions biblically and um, for him for salvation too if he is not saved. And also please uh, protect uh, David Lavile who is uh, in the army and um, just uh, thank you for the sacrifices who he's willing to make and I pray he just keeps you in mind while he's serving and that he just uh, does his best for you. And uh, if he's in any distress, he just grows closer to you. Um, thank you, Father, for listening. Uh, in your name I pray. Amen. Oh Lord, I just want to lift up a few prayer requests from the health side. And first, I want to pray for those that, in the church that may that are going through a difficult time that may not have submitted a prayer request that are carrying some kind of burden. I pray, Lord, that you would help them get through it, give them the grace and the peace that they need. Lord, I pray for Rich Walker, has a severe case of nausea, hasn't been able to eat for over two weeks. Lord, we know you're the great physician and you know all things, and I pray you'd restore him 100%. I pray he'd get his health back and he'd be able to eat on his own. Pray for our sister Sandy, who's going through knee replacement surgery. I heard that's a painful procedure, at least after the fact. And I pray you'd help her recovery. You'd give strength to her knees and her legs and help her to, to endure it, God. We pray for Pam Dalton's neighbor who fell and broke his neck in, in three places. Uh, I don't know what the lasting effects will be, but I, we know you do. And I pray, God, that uh, we know you can do all things, and I pray you'd restore his health. I pray, God, that uh, he'd be able to move again, walk again. But if not, I pray you'd give him the grace that he needs, Lord. And I pray you'd help Pam to be a blessing. Lord, we pray for uh, Steve Reyes in Chile. Would you help his ministry? Help him in that field. I thank you, God, for his willingness to go. And I pray, Lord, you put a hedge of protection about him and those he serves. Give him power. Give him your spirit, Lord, as he gives your, your word. We pray for Marcia, um, according to the, the bulletin here. We need strength and peace. I don't, I don't know the situation, but again, you know all things, and I pray you'd help her go through whatever it is that she needs. I pray you'd give her grace, Lord, and, and show her that you love her. We pray for our bus ministry and for our kids. Of course, first and foremost, Lord, I pray for their salvation. I pray as they come out here, they would hear the gospel, you'd stir their hearts, they put their trust in you. And I pray you bless the efforts to, to raise money for another bus or more transportation, uh, the tag sale and, and other efforts. Lord, I pray you bless it for your glory. We pray for uh, Diana McHugh, uh, one of our shut-ins, Lord, that you be with her and give her grace and comfort. We pray for our, our college students some are graduating. Uh, pray for some that they would find employment for the summer. Uh, give them direction, Lord, and, and show them your will for their life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymnals again, if you would. Turn to hymn 359. 359, Wonderful Words of Life. We'll sing the first and the third. First and the third. <clears throat> Sing. 
Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Number three. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, holy Savior, sanctify forever, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. All right, uh, ushers, if you'll prepare to get ready to come forward, um, we're going to do the missionary letter first. Uh, our missionary letter tonight is from uh, Mike and Panan Limon. Uh, did I say that wrong? No. Okay. Lehman? Okay. Missionaries to Thailand. It says, flee, uh, the, the, the heading of this uh, particular par paragraph is, flee from the wrath to come. I love the words that John the Baptist spoke to some who came to be baptized but did not actually come for the right reason. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, he asked. It has frequently been our experience that people come, but for the wrong reasons. What I see often is that they do not come because of the conviction of sin, the awareness of coming judgment, or the opportunity to be born again. They are not fleeing the, the wrath to come, but they've, they've come to add a blessing to their life or add an other God to their portfolio of, and then in quotation marks, gods. I have come to the place where I just straight out tell people who I share the gospel with that I have good news to give them, but I have to tell them the bad news first. I've become more aware of, of this as we have uh, seen an influx of people coming to our church recently. I believe I had reported in the last prayer letter that we were in a dry spell. Well, this last month, it's been the opposite. In April, we had four people receive Christ. One woman came to Sri, uh, Sri Raka in January to open a spa near the church. A friend in Bangkok recommended she come to our church. She said she had just become a Christian in December. It became apparent, though, that she really had never heard the truth, not having seen her in church. For some time, I stopped by to see her at the spa one day. Um, I just sat down and asked her, what exactly did they share with you uh, when you believed? She answered that they didn't share anything. Those who, quote unquote, led her to Christ, just asked, do you want to accept Christ? And she did. She explained to me that she was just adding Jesus to her list of gods that she relies on to help her and give her blessing. She allowed me to open the Bible and starting with the scriptures uh, that show our sinful lost conditions, I proceeded to show her uh, what, is re what it really means to believe in Jesus Christ. She prayed that night to accept Christ. The following Sunday, she didn't just show up, but showed up with a, with a employee from her shop, a man who was very intent on hearing the gospel. I got to sit down with him, explain the truth of sin, judgment, and mercy in Christ, and he, ha he made a decision to accept Christ as well. It ends up he is an ordained monk who is getting ready to return to life at the temple, but delayed it to help teach uh, Thai massage at the spa. How great is God's timing? He seems to me to be one of uh, one who God has been preparing for a long time to hear the gospel. He also has a student who works at the spa who has had a very rough life and came to the church twice in the last week. I've shared the gospel with her, and while she told someone who asked that she had already accepted Christ, after talking to her, I am certain that there are some things she does not yet understand. Lastly, there was a young lady uh, we met on Friday visitation, a girl without father or mother, another rough life. 
She's been, uh, been coming to various services for a month or so. On Wednesday, she approached Penan and asked if she could accept Christ. I had a couple of the women, women of our, uh, a couple of women from our church deal with her. After the service, she excitedly went around telling everyone she had believed. Praise the Lord. And then he says, thank you uh, that, that your fruit may remain. A few years ago, some church members brought a husband and wife who came and received Christ at our church. They were with us for several months and then had to move away to an outer province. We tried to point them to a church that was accessible to them. They left, and while we prayed for them from time to time, I didn't give their situation much thought. Well, they showed back up for a visit a few months ago and with a crowd of people. It ends up that they uh, built quite a uh, fellowship in their uh, hometown and have won people to Christ. One of the people who came to visit with them told me that their husband and wife were very good at sharing the gospel. I have to admit I felt bad that I had not given them more attention and did not have a little more faith that God uh, would cause these who came to know Christ with us to go on and do great things. Praise the Lord for fruit that remains and that it is God by his own power that makes it happen. And so praise the Lord for this missionary letter and this great report of works going on in Thailand. Ushers, if you'll come forward, we'll collect this evening's offerings and tithes and faith promise giving. Just a reminder that our uh, Memorial Day picnic is coming up on Monday. We're going to have a, a good time with that as we remember our uh, country and uh, we memorialize those who are, have served, are serving, and have uh, paid the ultimate price. So uh, try to be there. It starts at 11. It'll be done by 2. You'll be glad you did. Let's pray for this evening's offering. We ask uh, Mike Surratt if you would lead us in prayer. All right, for sake of time tonight, we're going to skip the last hymnal. Take your Bibles with me over to 1 Kings chapter number 3. 1 Kings 3. And we're going to continue our Through the Bible series. Uh, we um, uh, started in 1 Samuel some time ago, and the title of that one was The Boy Who Learned to Listen. And after The Boy Who Learned to Listen, we looked at, um, uh, let's see, what was the next lesson? Uh, the King Who Never Learned, talking about Saul. And then we talked about the king that God loved in David, and tonight we're going to look at uh, King Solomon, and we're going to look at the king who had it all, the king who had it all. Uh, so when you find 1 Kings 3, if you wouldn't mind, stand for the reading of God's word. It's been a while since you've stood, so this will give you a chance to stretch those legs, keep you awake, get that blood flowing. Maybe I should let you run in place, right? 1 Kings 3, and we're going to be reading from verse 4 down through verse 9. The Bible says, And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. 
And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, uh, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? Tonight we're going to look at the king who had it all. A secondary title would be Solomon, a life of paradox. Let's pray. God, I ask tonight that you'd help us as we look at uh, this topic of wisdom and a king who had wisdom, wealth. Uh, Lord, he, he had um, wisdom, wealth, and wives, really. He had it all uh, by the standards of that day, and yet he still found himself to be miserable. And so tonight, I pray you'd help us to look at what the key is to true joy and happiness. And Lord, I pray that we leave determined to follow that plan and, Lord, that we would um, take the life of Solomon and we would see the goods and the bads. And, Lord, we would learn from his history to make our lives more like you and to draw us closer to you. And, Lord, I pray that tonight you'd give everyone the stamina to make it through the message. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me to preach in a way, teach in a way that would be interesting enough to keep everyone's attention. We ask, every, we ask this in your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. All right, if you know it with me. Once you recognize the verse I'm quoting, I want you to quote it with me. Ready? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. God will give wisdom to anybody who asks for it. How important is wisdom? How important is it? Surely Solomon in his writings places a large, a huge emphasis on it, and probably more so than any other author in the Bible. Now, just to be clear, God is the author of the Bible, and the other men, 29 or 30 men, they were his secretaries that wrote it out for him. That's really the best way I know how to put it. But God did use the personalities, he did use the experiences of those authors in pinning down the words of the book, and no doubt Solomon's experience was that wisdom's a big deal. And i got to say that wisdom is a big deal. Proverbs tells us over and over and over again about just how far wisdom can take you in life. Let me make a proposition this evening, if I could. Wisdom alone is not enough to be successful in life. It's not enough. Wisdom on its own, is not sufficient to get you through life being successful. Let me give you a formula. If you have your outline there, this formula really is the whole introduction to this message tonight in just a word math formula. You say, Pastor, I don't like letters in my math. I'm going to go back to high school. Keep the X's and Y's out of the math equations, right? I can handle 2 plus 2, but I can't handle 2X plus 2, all right? I'm going to give you a, um, a word equation here. Ready? Wisdom plus godliness equals spiritual success. Wisdom plus godliness equals spiritual success. If you take either wisdom out, and you're just godly, but you don't seek God for His wisdom, you're not going to know spiritual success. If you live off God's wisdom, but you're not godly, you won't know spiritual success. I've given a quote like this similar at some point in the past, uh, but really for what we're looking at tonight, this quote just fits in so well with the sermon. And so, uh, um, and again, repetition is the key to learning. And so I'm going to give it again here. Um, Here's the quote, the walk with God that is necessary to obtain heavenly wisdom is as important as the heavenly wisdom that you obtain. Let that sink in for a minute. The walk with God that is necessary to obtain heavenly wisdom is as important as the heavenly wisdom that you obtain. Um, you've heard the quote, the man that walks with God will always arrive at his destination. I believe that. But i got to say that walking with God is part of the destination. It's not the entire destination. There's more to the Christian life than just walking with God. But that is part of the destination. If you can learn how to walk with God, boy, you, you've got a leg up on a lot of people. And that, that daily walk with the Lord where you're asking for wisdom, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. 
In the same chapter that James tells us how to get wisdom, he also offers this to add to our Christian living. Listen to this. James 1, 22 through 25. He says this. He says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. What do, what do these verses mean? It talks about the importance of doing, right? The doing of the word, but also the spending time in the word. It's the looking into the, into the perfect law of liberty, the walk with God that goes along with uh, the getting of wisdom. Again, wisdom plus godliness equals spiritual success. I believe that Solomon's life can be summed up in one word, and that is the word paradox. Paradox. The Bible tells us that he was the wisest man to ever walk the earth. Wisest man ever to walk the earth. Why would a man with so much wealth, wisdom, and honor write in his own autobiography, which is the book of Ecclesiastes, that his life was filled with hurt and vanity? He had the most wisdom of any man that's ever walked the earth. And he gets down to the end of, the, end of, the, end of his life, and in his autobiography, the, the main word you find is the word vanity. Vanity of vanities. My life was filled with vanities. And the answer is very simple. Wisdom is not the end game. Walking with God to get the wisdom is just as important as the wisdom that you obtain. Throughout the lesson this evening, we're going to see points and times in Solomon's life where he was wise and godly, and we're going to look at times where he was um, wise but godless. And we're going to see the difference between what happens when you're wise and godly and when you're wise and godless. Let's jump into the outline tonight. Number one is this Solomon's position. Again, we're looking at uh, the life of Solomon here, 1 Kings, kind of through a, uh, uh, a bird's eye view from a macro standpoint. So we're not going to get too much into the nitty gritty in one passage, but we'll look at several passages and move on. Look at 1 Kings chapter 1 with me and verse 28. 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 28. It should be, just be a page over there from where you were. The Bible says there, Then King David answered and said, Call me Bathsheba. At this point, Bathsheba is his, his wife. Bathsheba is the mother of Solomon. And uh, we're well past the events where uh, 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 David had fooled around with Bathsheba. This is years later where Bathsheba is, uh, is his accepted wife. So again, verse 28, Then King, King David answered and said, Call me Bathsheba. And she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore and said, As the Lord liveth, that hath redeemed my soul out of all distress, even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, thy son, assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead. Even so will I certainly do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said, Let my Lord King David live forever. Skip down uh, with me to verse 39 there. And Zadok the priest took in a horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon. And they blew the trumpet and all the people said, God save King Solomon. And all the people came up after him and the people piped with pipes and rejoiced with great joy so that the earth rent with the sound of them. So David gets down to the end of his life. He's getting ready to die. He calls in Bathsheba, and there's a lot of turmoil there. There's some of other of David's children who want to be king, but David handpicks Solomon on his deathbed, and uh, there's a slight time of, of distress there uh, of whether or not Solomon's actually going to be the king, but sure enough, Solomon's anointed king, and uh, we see here Solomon's position. He's a young man. Uh, he doesn't feel necessarily qualified, but uh, nonetheless, he's appointed to be the king, the predecessor to his father, King David. Number two, we see Solomon's plea. Solomon's plea. Here we find this young man, this young king, overwhelmed by his duties. Early into his reign, he's, he's lost in the maze of his temple, or rather of his, of his, uh, of his palace, he doesn't even know how to go in and out of his own palace, uh, he, he admits. And he, he, so he takes a trip 
to a mountain in Gibeon, and God steps in and asks Solomon what it is that he most desires. Look down with me back at 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 7. 1 Kings chapter 3, we'll be looking at verse 7 here. Now, I have another sermon that I preach that talks about why God came to Solomon and uh, the formula to get God to come to you. Uh, uh, and so I won't, I won't dwell on that tonight. But notice that Solomon had been performing sacrifices unto the Lord when God approached him. That's a big deal. But again, that's for another, uh, that's for another sermon of the night. Look at verse 7. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant King David, inst- uh, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child, I know not how to go in or come out, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted uh, for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? We see a desperate Solomon. I mean, he's desperate. He's left his palace. He's left Jerusalem. He's escaped into this mountain in Gibeon. There he he is trying to figure out what to do. Uh, There he's figuring out uh, uh, how God can help him. And he's crying out to the Lord. He's saying, I'm lost. I don't know how to do this. And I got people coming to me and they're asking me questions. And I have no idea what the answers are. and, 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 And I don't know how David did it. Uh, you know, it's really easy when you sit back and you look at someone who, who holds a position of authority. You think, oh, I could do that. That's easy. And then you get appointed. You know, you, you remember back before you were a parent. And you uh, you know what? Can't you just get your kids to behave? What's wrong with you? Don't let your kid run around all over the church. Just, just, just spank them. I mean, come on. That's so easy. And then you have kids. And it's like, oh, I'm never criticizing anybody ever again. This is hard, Right? Uh, or, uh, you know, um, uh, you, you, before maybe you got married, you looked around at marriage, you thought, oh, marriage, that's easy. You know, you just kiss all the time, and life's great, right? And then you get married, and you find out, this is a whole lot harder than I thought. Uh, I'm different than him, or I'm different than her, depending on your gender, and, and, and why can't they just think like me? And they don't think like you, because God didn't create them that way. And uh, you get into it, and you learn real quick, wow, this is a whole lot harder than I thought. And I'm sure uh, Solomon was, was uh, looking at David and thought, oh, I could run the kingdom. That's easy. Yeah, that's easy. And then he's handed the keys of the kingdom, and oh boy, people are coming to him and asking him questions, and, and now he doesn't know what to do, and probably feeling overwhelmed, he escapes out of uh, Jerusalem into Gibeon, and he's seeking the Lord's face for help, and we do see, we'll look at uh, everything that God said to Solomon here in a minute, but skip down to verse 16 of 1 Kings 3, and we do see that God does give Solomon an immense amount of wisdom. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. The one woman said, O my Lord, I and, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house, and it came to pass the third day after this I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also, and we were together. There were, was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. Uh, and she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid uh, her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But uh, when I had considered in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son and the dead is thy son. And then my, my mic dropped. Okay, there it is. Uh, no, but the dead is thy son and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king, and the king said, Divide the living child in two. Give one half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O my lord, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. And the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. So Solomon had pleaded for wisdom, and 
uh, God, gave her, God gave Solomon that wisdom. Now, we know that story. We've all heard that story. And so you already know what Solomon's going to say. But put yourself in King Solomon's place and forget that you already know what he's supposed to do. You have two women arguing over a child. Um, not too many people are going to say, bring me a sword and chop the child in half. That's pretty extreme. And Solomon was not going to allow the child to be uh, cut in half. He, he knew he knew that the mother of the child would, uh, would keep that from happening. But God did give him that wisdom. Point number three, we see Solomon's prophet. Solomon's prophet. Look down with me at verse number 10 of 1 Kings 3. And after Solomon, God comes to Solomon and says, you know, what do I, what can I give you? Name it and it's yours. Almost like a genie in a, in a bottle. Almost. Now, I've got to say, Solomon earned the right for God to come and ask him that. But uh, what if God came to you and said, I'll give you anything you want? One thing. You name it. It's yours. Anything you want. Some of you are like, man, I would be filthy rich. You're not to love money. You're not to love money. Um, I think because we have the full canon of Scripture, I think we have an idea of maybe what to ask for. But i got to say that I don't even know that this was the best option. Look at verse 10. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that uh, which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there sh shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And, and notice the condition here, if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. So God promised um, uh, Solomon here uh, two guarantees. He said, I'm going to give you on top of the wisdom, I'm going to give you riches and honor. We'll get into all that in a minute. Uh, but then he gave him one conditional promise. He said, if you'll walk with me and you'll keep my statues, I'll give you long life. Now, what, what, what were the riches that Solomon accrued because he asked God for wisdom? I've done some math. I've done some research. Solomon's annual salary, if you, if you convert that to U.S. dollars, is estimated to be about half a billion dollars a year. Not million, not billion, not one billion. Or rather, uh, yeah, yeah, not, uh, well, not a billion, not one million, five hundred million dollars a year. He owned 40,000 horses. He owned 1,400 chariots. He owned a fleet of ships. His ivory throne, that by itself is impressive, was overlaid with gold and had six steps and a rounded back with armrests. It had 12 golden lions that surrounded it with two resting on each step. It's been estimated that his value at the end of his life was somewhere in the range of $30 billion dollars. 30 billion with a B dollars. So uh, because he asked for wisdom, God gave him a great profit. We've seen here Solomon's position. He was king. Solomon's plea. He begged for wisdom. Solomon's profit, honor, wealth, and long life. Number four, moving quickly, Solomon's passion. Solomon's passion. Uh, if you could hold your place there in uh, Kings, turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter 3. 2 Chronicles chapter 3. And, and we're going to look at uh, verse, verses 3 through 9 here. We're going to look at what Solomon was passionate about. I've got to say, this is a good thing to be passionate about. 
I'm going to begin reading. You can catch up with me when you get there. Second Chronicles 3, I'm going to begin the reading in verse 3. The Bible says, Now these are the things wherein Solomon was instructed for the building of the house of God. The length by a cubit after the first measure was three score or sixty cubits, and the breadth twenty cubits, and the porch that was in the front of, of the house. The length of it was according to the breadth of the house twenty cubits, and the height was an hundred and twenty, and he overlaid it within with pure gold, and the greater house he sealed uh, uh, with uh, fir trees, with fir tree, which he overlaid with fine gold and set there on palm trees and chains. And he garnished the house with precious stones for beauty. And the gold was gold of parvium. He overlaid also the house, uh, the beams, the posts, and the walls thereof, and the doors thereof with gold, and great cherubims on the walls. And he made the most holy house, the length whereof uh, was according to the breadth of the house, 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 20 cubits, and he overlaid it with fine gold, amounting to 600 talents. And the weight of the nails was 50 shekels of gold, and he overlaid the upper chambers with gold. Put that next slide up there for me. This is the best uh, artist rendering I've been able to find. You won't be able to read the fine print from where you are. If you Google Solomon's temple, you can find that picture pretty quickly. I don't, don't do it right now. Amen. Wait, wait till you get home. Uh, but uh, there you get an idea. They kind of cut open uh, Solomon's temple so you can get an idea of the dimensions there. But probably the most impressive building that's ever been built on planet Earth in the history of mankind. Solomon dumped his wealth into this. The temple itself was 45 feet long. It was 30 feet wide. There was a porch that more, looked more like a tower than a front entrance. Now, we don't know, uh, the scripture doesn't tell us how tall the rest of Solomon's temple was, but it does tell us that the porch was 180 feet tall or 18 stories. Everything, everything was plated in gold. Talk about Midas touch. There was precious stones. There were precious stones everywhere. Solomon took that wealth that he had uh, gained and he poured it into this temple. All throughout Scripture, you find that God puts an emphasis on his place of worship or having a place of worship. In the Old Testament, we know that the place of worship was the tabernacle. And then uh, Solomon built his temple. And then there was a second temple uh, uh, built when uh, they left Babylon. Uh, in the New Testament, you find people gathering in synagogues and then people gathering in church houses. And God wants his people to congregate and worship. Amen? And you're here on a Wednesday night, so clearly you believe that. So I'm not going to hammer that point. What was Solomon's passion? It was the temple of God. By the way, David wanted to build the temple, but he had blood on his hands from all the war. And God said, you can't build it. You can save up money. You can stockpile money. I'm going to give your son peace on every coast, on every border, and I'm going to let him, who won't be a man of war, I'm going to let him build this temple. And boy, did he ever build a temple. Number five, notice Solomon's prayer. Solomon's prayer. Solomon poured seven and a half years of his life into the construction of this temple. That's not a very big building, per se, to take seven and a half years to build it, he was drawing out resources from other areas, getting his gold from a particular place, uh, getting the cedars from a particular place, the wood, and, and, and then plating everything in gold and paying attention to all those details. Uh, Solomon poured seven and a half years of his life and, and just all the resources he could into making this temple be ready. Once it was completed, he prayed a very, 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 very lengthy prayer of dedication uh, that, endure, that ended with God endorsing the temple by sending down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice that uh, was laid there on the altar. We find this prayer in 2 Chronicles 6. Because it's so long, uh, we're not going to read it tonight, but I will just kind of give you the highlights of the prayer if I could. Verses 14 and 15 of 2 Chronicles 6, Solomon gives God the glory. Can I say that's always a great place to start? Give God the glory. If you do some great work with your hands, give God the glory. Because He is the one that has given you the power to do it. Don't sit back and go, oh, wow, look what I did. Aren't I great? Don't, don't break your arm patting yourself on the back, right? Give God the glory. Verse 16 and 17 of that chapter, Solomon begs God to remain faithful to Israel. 
verses 18 through 21, Solomon asks God to make the temple his dwelling place. Obviously, he had dwelled in the, taber- in the tabernacle, and Solomon wanted God to move residents into the temple. Verse 22 and 23, Solomon asks God to be Israel's moral judge and to do so within the confines of the temple, that that judging would happen there in the temple. From verses 24 through 31 and then verses 34 through 39, Solomon begs God to listen to the generations that will fall into sin. He asks God to forgive them uh, when they come crawling back and, and, and when they ask for it. Verses 32 and 33, Solomon requests, and this is, this is really important. Maybe uh, this uh, little tidbit uh, will be something you pull out of the sermon tonight that you can walk away with. Verses 32 and 33, Solomon requests to God that the temple be an international place of worship. You say, why is that important? Solomon wanted... The temple to be for everybody, not just the Jews. Why? Because God was calling everybody to repentance. He didn't just start saving Gentiles uh, with Cornelius in the New Testament. God wants to save everybody. And so uh, uh, people uh, by Solomon's prayer here were invited to come into the temple, even if they were of non-Jewish descent. Verse 40 through 42, Solomon ends his prayer by asking God to again dwell in the temple. Look with me at 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 1. It says there, now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. That's another one of those things I hope God's recorded. I want to see that when I get to heaven. Solomon prays this long prayer. He has, and if you go and read all the sacrifices that were made, and they were basically the type of sacrifices that the people could eat, and so they could enjoy a feast there. But boy, the, the fire came out of heaven and, and, and consumed the, the, that particular sacrifice, and God's presence moved in. And i got to say that I want to pray in a way where God's presence moves in. I don't want to pray in a way where I get up and go, well, I got through that ritual. Time to move on with my day. You know, when you, if you pray right, when you get through praying, you ought to feel as though God brings a serenity and a peace over you that just wasn't there when uh, you started that prayer. Because God's presence, if you're saved, He's moved in, but now He takes control. Number six, we've looked at all the good, good sides of Solomon so far. Number six, let's look at Solomon's promiscuity. Solomon's promiscuity. Back in 1 Kings chapter 11, we find Solomon, this wise, wise, wise man, had an Achilles heel. And that Achilles heel was, you guessed it, women. And not just one woman, 700 wives, 300 concubines. I'm not going to go into detail on what a concubine is. You can study that out for yourself. But 700 wives and 300 concubines. Solomon had a problem. Solomon had a problem. And by the way, beyond the obvious reasons on why Solomon would have wanted so many wives, it really was a status thing for him um, to, to, to show his wealth and his power. Look at verse 1 of 1 Kings 11. The Bible says, But King Solomon loved many, and here was his downfall, strange women. Together with the daughters of Pharaoh, many of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonites, and Hittites. By the way, the reason why he married women from all of these kingdoms was so that he could have peace with these kings. It's very hard to go in and attack a country when your daughter lives in that country, right? That's why he married these women uh, uh, of, of these other palaces from these other countries, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their God. Solomon clang unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Asheroth, the goddess of the Zidians, 
Asheroth was a wicked god. And, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Boy, I sure don't want that said about me. That he, he went somewhat after the Lord, but he did not go fully after the Lord. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, um, uh, the abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he uh, for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And he commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, uh, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from me, from thee, and will give it to thy servant. We know that servant to be the guy who would become the king of the divided kingdom, who happened to be uh, there working in Solomon's palace. But nonetheless, what, what happened to, to uh, Solomon here is that he married wrong. He married wrong. Now, I don't want to turn the sermon into some kind of a sexist remark that Solomon got his heart turned by women and all women are out to get men. I, that's, don't, twist, don't, don't twist my words, amen? That's not what I'm saying. Anybody who marries someone who's lost while being saved, they are setting themselves up for failure. This, this king married all these women, and the Bible says this happened to him when he was old. I have a theory. I think that David married these girls for status and because he was taking the protection into his own hands instead of trusting God. And then, at first, these wives came to him and, Oh, we love you, Solomon. Oh, we want you to, to, uh, to allow us to, to worship our gods. Will you build us? You have so much money. Will you build us a, a, a temple for our gods? And Solomon said, No, I'm not doing that. I, I serve the one true and living God. But day after day, week after week, year after year, they kept wearing him down. When he got old, he gave in. He gave in. And he built, allowed these uh, statutes to be built. And by the way, again, we're taking a macro look at the book, so we're not diving into deep details, but some of these gods that were built were gods that sacrificed children by fire. And Solomon allowed this to happen in his own country under his own nose. Why? Because Solomon wanted women. He wanted a multitude of them. He wanted a promiscuous lifestyle. The last point we'll look at here is number seven, Solomon's persuasion. Solomon's persuasion. Will you go with me over to Ecclesiastes chapter 12? Again, this is kind of Solomon's autobiography of his life, in, in a sense. He calls himself a preacher in the beginning of the book. And by the way, if you have a problem with materialism, I would really encourage you to read through Ecclesiastes because Solomon may have been the most materialistic man ever to live. And he got down to the end after having $30 billion to his name and having a salary of $500 million a year and, and going through and listing everything that he bought. And he get down to the end and he said, it's vanity, it's misery, I just wish I hadn't done it. Look at verse 1 of Ecclesiastes 12. What does Solomon, this rich, powerful, wise man, say? He says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Solomon's looking back over his life and he says, If I could go back and I could do it all over again, I would have remembered my creator in the days of my youth. I would not have chased all the things that my money could chase. I would not have chased all the wives that, that my, my heart desired. I would, have, I, would have pursued, I would have pursued my creator. Look down at verse 13. I love this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. But how fascinating. Solomon's conclusion to life is simple. Fear or reverence or be in awe 
or respect God. That's one. Two, obey and trust God. Nowhere, and this is what I really find fascinating. And I don't know that I've ever really heard anybody point this out. But isn't it fascinating that verse 13 doesn't say anything about wisdom? Nowhere does he say that getting wisdom even matters. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, that has nothing to do with wisdom, and keep His commandments. You know what I think Solomon realized by the end of his life? If and when I needed wisdom, I could have gone to God, and He would have given me what I needed for that moment. What happens when you give a child everything? What happens? You spoil them, don't you? How many of you admit you're a spoiled brat? (laughs) everyone's looking at you Brian I can't figure out why (laughs) I don't think you're a spoiled brat for whatever it's worth Um, God gave Solomon all the wisdom at one time he backed up the truck dump truck and boom dropped it on Solomon and I'm just going to tell you the truth I'm not questioning God's decision God's ways are perfect okay but I think that ruined Solomon in a lot of ways I think it ruined Solomon you know I don't think I want God to give me all the wisdom in the world at one time. I want God to give it to me day by day, moment by moment. I want to go to God each morning and say, Lord, today I'm going to face things I didn't face yesterday. And today I'm going to need your wisdom fresh and new. And not more than I need, but not less than I need. And, you know, I have found myself going into a day not praying that prayer. And by the middle of the day, I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm lost. I don't know how to go in and out of the church building. And i got to drop my head and say, Lord, I forgot to ask you for wisdom today, didn't I? I wrote this down here in the conclusion. Wisdom minus godliness equals vanity. Wisdom minus godliness equals vanity. You know what happened to Solomon is he had wisdom, but he stopped walking with God. And what did he get? Vanity of vanities. Vanity of vanities. However, wisdom plus godliness, wisdom plus godliness equals spiritual fulfillment. Now I will say this. I do believe if you read your Bible and pray, the Bible is the wealth of wisdom. Okay? Okay. The more you memorize wisdom, or rather, the more you memorize the Bible, the more spiritual wisdom you will accrue. The more saturated the sponge of your mind becomes with Scripture, the more wisdom will just leak right out of you. Okay, I understand that. But there are situations where uh, you go to God and you say, beyond the Scripture, remind me of Scripture, take need. And again, I would finish the sermon with this quote, the walk with God that is necessary to obtain heavenly wisdom is as important as the heavenly wisdom that you obtain. I can really sum it up this way tonight. Are you asking God for wisdom? Are you doing it every day? You say, Pastor, I don't need wisdom to go grocery shopping. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You've been in these grocery stores, by the way. They've got like 5 million options. You need wisdom. You say, Pastor, I don't need wisdom driving to church. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I don't need wisdom on my job. I've done that. It's routine. I've done it hundreds of times. Ask God for wisdom. Ask Him for that wisdom. And let Him help you along. Let's let's bow our heads and close our eyes tonight. Lord, thank You for Your Word. And uh, Lord, what it means. And Lord, the life of Solomon. And God giving us His life. God, I'm glad that by the end of the day he figured out that it's about fearing you and keeping your commandments. And God, that it's not just about wisdom, it's about walking with you to get the wisdom. And God, I pray that you'd help us to learn from that. I pray it would be a solemn reminder for us tonight. Move in our midst tonight as we have a short time of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and eyes closed. And we'll Miss Lizette... We'll begin playing the piano there. And if you'd like to come and use the altar tonight, it's open. I encourage you to come and kneel. And some of you are facing some pretty big problems right now in life. I sure hope you're asking God for His wisdom. I sure hope you're not trying to go at it alone. 
Well, you're just going to spin your wheels. You're just going to be frustrated. You ask Him for wisdom. And by the way, you get in the habit of doing that with the little problems. It's a whole lot easier to do it when you come to the big problems. One more, one more verse of invitation and we'll, we'll wrap it up tonight as the piano plays. Let's pray where you're at.